All right, so we're going to continue uh, in James chapter 3. Hopefully you guys are enjoying uh, going through this book. Sometimes when you hear preaching, uh, like expository preaching on books, then when you go and you read back those books, um, they will come a lot more alive to you, if that makes sense. I still, <laughs> you know, I still remember the day uh, when I was in youth group. And, uh, you know, you know, like when you don't really know what the Bible is? I don't know, maybe you guys grew up with Christian backgrounds. I, I didn't. So I always just thought, um, you know, the Bible was a bit like the Quran, where it's just like, you know, you, you open it, it's just like random sayings throughout the Bible. Um, you know, a bit like Proverbs. You know, Proverbs just has like sayings in it. That's what I thought the whole Bible was like. And I remember the day when, uh, you know, we were learning through the book of Galatians in youth group, and it, and it dawned on me that these were actually letters to churches. You know, and I, I guess uh, it, was, it was in the first year of when I was saved and we were learning through the Bible. And um, anyway, I just remember that kind of blew my mind a bit. I was like, wait a second, like, this is somebody actually writing a letter to churches and then we were learning through it. I started to understand what it was saying. It's the same as like when I was reading through the Bible like several times and then, you know, you're reading through Exodus, Leviticus, and, you know, the first time you read through it, it's like you're reading the words, but you have no idea what it's saying. But then as you start to get more familiar with the Bible and you read it, you start to visualize what it's actually describing. And, um, you know, that's what I mean by the Bible kind of comes alive to you. So it's the same when, you know, maybe you've read through James before and, you know, you read through it and it didn't really make sense to you. But then sometimes when you hear somebody teach on it and make sense of it, give you a bit of a rundown, then when you read through it yourself, that's when things that maybe I don't mention in the chapters start to come out to you. And that's where I believe it's the Holy Ghost actually revealing things to you as you read through the Word of God in your own study. Um, that's why it's always really good. So today we're going to go through James <coughs> chapter 3, and uh, a lot of it is on the tongue. Uh, not so much the body part itself, but the tongue being representative of the words that we speak and the dangers of the tongue. So we'll jump straight into it. So first section, which we're going to look at is verses 1 to 4, is the influence of your words. The influence of your words. So you know, there are chapters in the Bible where, you know, you kind of know what the theme is, you know, like the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, you got, you know, you got your pastoral epistles. Well, if you have a chapter about speech and a chapter about the dangers of the tongue, it's James chapter 3. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So we're talking about the influence of your words. So you can see here that as teachers, when it talks about being masters, it's like being a leader, being a teacher, being somebody that leads others, others that there are risks and responsibilities as a leader, right? And even though you may not, you know, be the bishop of this church, you may not be a manager, we, we all, you know, should be an example to others. You know, maybe you're a parent, so you take on these same risks and responsibilities that, you know, you, the, when you're a master, when you're somebody that leads others, then you have responsibilities, right? And you can affect others. And this is why it's saying here that you don't necessarily want to be too quickly, you know, a leader or master. Because why? Because you, when you teach and you lead others, if you lead them astray, right? If you teach them the wrong things, you are in more trouble than somebody who doesn't have that sort of influence. So you can see there it says, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So there's a bit of a warning there to anyone who wants to be a teacher or be a leader that they need to be careful with the things that they communicate and the things that they say because it's going to have some influence. It's going to affect other people. Now one thing we see from this passage is that, you see how it says we shall receive the greater condemnation. So like I mentioned in the last couple of chapters of James, is that not all sins are equal. Even though James 1 teaches that, you know, when you, when you break, um, uh, or was it uh, James chapter 2, that, you know, if you break one of the commandments, you know, it makes you a transgressor of the law. But that doesn't mean all sins are equal, right? Yeah, if you break a, a, one of God's commandments, it makes you a transgressor of the law. But not every commandment is the same. So we can see here that you can receive the greater condemnation because 
you know, teaching somebody when you're a master is different to just, you know, not being a master, right? They, they're going to receive the greater condemnation. So Jesus here in John 19, 11 says the same. Jesus answered, thou couldst have no power at all against me. So he's talking to Pilate here. Except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. So obviously Pilate was committing a sin in, in allowing Jesus to be killed unjustly, you know, listening to the Jews. The Jews obviously were um, committing a sin, delivering them unto Pilate. And what Jesus is saying here is that the people that were demanding Jesus to be killed and delivered Jesus to Pilate to be killed were actually committing the greater sin. So if all sin was equal, then obviously you wouldn't have greater sins and lesser sins. All right, let's continue. James 3 verse 2. For in many things we offend all. So this is why he's saying in James 3 verse 1, be not many masters and the, and the, the risks of you know, the, our communication as, as, as teachers is because it's, it's very easy. Words can offend a lot of people. You know, words can cause greater damage than actions sometimes because, you know, sometimes your actions are limited to the people that are surrounded to you, but the words you speak can spread far and wide. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. So what is he saying here? So words have, have an ability to cause a lot of damage, right? Because you can, you, can, you, can, you can mislead a lot of people. You know, your words can go out, and uh, you know, especially nowadays with the internet, right? Things go viral, things are on the internet, so you have to be even more careful when things are on the internet. He says here, if any man offend not in word. So he's saying, if, if you are able to control your tongue, control your words, and have you know, um, discipline over the things you say, the same is a perfect man. Isn't that a pretty profound thought there? That he's saying that, that if you can control your speech, and it's not, I guess it's not just the things you say, but I guess your words come from your heart, isn't it? So this is why when you can control your words, you have control over your heart. And obviously if you're able to completely control your words and have control over your heart to the point that you don't ever offend in word, the Bible's saying here, well, then you are, you've, re you've, you've arrived. You're perfect. Right? Well, so it's, it's never possible to be perfect. But that's how uh, influential you know, the, your thoughts and your tongue is over the rest of everything you do. Able also to bridle the whole body. So what does it mean to bridle? It means to control, right? And that's why it talks about later putting bridle um, in, the, in the horse's mouth, like the bits in the horse's mouth. People sometimes call that a bridle. So, words can cause greater damage than actions, can't they? So we need to take care with the things we say. Look at what it says here in Ephesians 4, 20, 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. So this is a great verse to memorize. Right? When you think about how should we talk as a Christian? Right? Well, are you speaking with corrupt communication? What is corrupt communication? Might be like false things, might be like, you know, swear like filthy conversation, right? Saying, you know, dirty jokes, swearing, things like that. Um, just the way we talk. But that which is the good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now, there's a saying that is quite popular and we, we use it to sort of encourage people that may be being bullied, you know, and people say things in the world and, and the saying goes, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Um, but is that true? You know, I, I don't think that's true. I think we say that to encourage people to try and like say, hey, you know, well, it didn't physically hurt you, but should we have that attitude uh, that, you know, oh, words don't hurt people, therefore we should be flippant about the things we say. Well, no, because like I was showing here and what James is talking about, that the tongue is actually very dangerous. Words can do a lot of damage. And the Bible actually has some proverbs about words as well. Proverbs 18, verse 8, look at this, the words of a talebearer. So what will we call a talebearer today, like a gossip. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. 
So you can almost say that you know, words are able to affect you in ways that, that physical things cannot, right? So you know, which ones are more dangerous, right? When the Bible talks about even words affecting your health, right? And, and, and we can see that because you know, obviously when people are upset or people are stressed, you know, people are getting bullied, like that can have a, that mental impact can have an impact on their physical health as well, as opposed to the other way around, right? So look at Proverbs 18, verse 14. These are all in Proverbs 18. The spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. But look at this, but a wounded spirit, who can bear? So the spirit of somebody is very closely related to their attitude and their words, right? You think about the spirit of God as the word of God. When I think of the spirit of a person, it's kind of like their attitude and the things that they say. How do you know somebody's spirit? Because of the things that they say. But look, you can wound somebody's spirit, right? So if somebody's spirit is wounded and you can't wound, you know, I mean, you, you know, you can try and break somebody down, but sometimes, you know, the flesh, you might break them, but you don't break their spirit. You know, you sometimes see that in, uh, I don't know, in, um, in life. But if the spirit is broken, then what? Right? Not even then is it enough to be physically. So the spirit of a man will sustain his infirmity. So you see how the spirit supports the body. But when the spirit is wounded, it's, it's not so easy the other way around. Right? Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. So, you know, even we talk about the, the tongue having this power over people and the words that we speak having this strong influence. And it kind of lines up, you know, with the word of God, you know, being the way God's influence goes throughout the world. And salvation comes by believing on the word of God, but also not believing on the word of God. And believing a lie can also lead to death. So, I don't believe that the saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, is true. Because I think our words actually can cause more damage than even physical hurt. Because you can, you can, you can beat somebody up, but you may not break their spirit. But if you can break their spirit with, with words, you know, then the Bible says then, um, you know, a wounded spirit, who can bear? All right, let's continue. Verse 3 and 4. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very, very small helm, whithersoever the governor listed. So this ties in with verse number two, where verse number two is saying, hey, if you're able to control your words, if you're able to control your tongue, then it bridles the whole body. So now he's giving two analogies here that they put bits in the horse's mouth. And I believe that that's often called a bridle, right? When you put that thing in the horse's mouth. And just from the horse's mouth, you're able to control the horse. So if you think about the horse, the horse is this strong, you know, work animal. You know, that's why, that's why they use them in the police, right? They use them to control crowds because not only are they strong, there are animals that, you know, are a lot bigger and stronger than the horse, but they're not as like nimble. You know, they can't, they can't run as fast and jump and all that sort of stuff. You, know, you think about the elephant, it's not as fast. You know, the hippo is quite dangerous. You know, it's quite short, stubby legs. And, you know, and they, maybe they don't uh, you know, obey man as much. So when you think about the horse, the horse is used in war. The horse is used on farms. The horse is very strong. I mean, it's even used by the police. So this huge animal that they use, but you can control the horse with a bridle in its mouth and control its whole body. We turn about their whole body. So it's the same. He's saying here with the ships, which though they be so great, and you look at outside forces, are able to move these ships around. And you think about machinery. I mean, are ships, I was just trying to think about this last night. I mean, aren't ships like the biggest vessels that we have? So you think about planes, like planes are not as big. You have planes land on ships. And then, um, yeah, and then the ships are humongous. You know, they, they, you know, they break the hull of the, sh the, the champagne on the hull of the ship and then they let it slide into the water. These huge freight, you know, um, ships are just humongous. I mean, you could say a train is very long, but train, you can think about it as a separated carriages, but in terms of like a one-piece thing, I mean, ships really are like really huge. So this humongous ship, says, which they, they be so great, are driven of fierce winds, so the winds can move them around, yet 
are they turned about, they are controlled with a very small helm. What is it? It's the, the, where they control the ship, the steering wheel of the ship is a tiny little place within the ship, and yet it controls the whole ship. And this is the analogies that we're given about the tongue and the body. And what I'm hoping that as we talk through this, we talk about you know, the, the imagery that the Bible and, and God is giving here about the tongue and the tongue's influence over the body and the tongue's influence over other people and the dangers of the tongue that you'll walk away from this sermon being a bit more considerate about, considerate about the thing, things you say. Yet are they turned about with a very small hand, whithersoever, so in anywhere the governor listeth. So the governor is the one controlling the ship. Listeth is an old word for desire, right? So if you think it's, it's linked to the word lust, right? So it's the same in uh, John chapter 3. It says the wind blow it where, it where it listeth, right? So it's just saying wherever the governor wants it to go. So the tongue is similar in its influence over the body, isn't it? So we talked about the influence of your words. Now we get on to the danger, the danger of your words. James 3, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. So you see that the tongue can, can control great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, our body parts, that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. So that's some imagery there describing the tongue. And if we internalise this, we should be a lot more careful with the things that we say to one another and to things we say even to other people. So it's saying here that the spread of words is like fire. I mean, we use the, the terminology today on the internet like it's viral. It spreads like a virus, whereas the Bible here is saying like it spreads like, like wildfire, like a fire just burning through. And we know that that just burns like crazy. And, and, and the, the largest fires are created just from a little spark, you know, a little ember that just burns and it grows and it grows and it causes a lot of damage. So if you think of the way fire spreads, fire spreads very quickly, but it also causes a lot of damage in its wake. And that's what gossip can do. You know, gossip and you know, slander and the way we talk about things it can spread very quickly. It can cause a lot of damage. It's very hard to control once it gets out there. And sometimes the damage it, it causes, it, it, it can change things forever. You know, people can get burnt. People can lose their lives in fire. You know, their property is gone. But we think about that in a spiritual sense with words, you know, and we, 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 we reflect on that. We need to take great care with the words that we speak. So I was saying the tongue is the same, it boasts great things. How great a matter, a little fire kindling. The tongue is a fire, right? And remember, it's, it's obviously talking about the words we speak, even though it's referring to the body part. A world of iniquity. What is that? What is iniquity? Sin. So is the tongue among, among our body part, that it defileth the whole body. So see, not only does it do damage to other people, but it can do damage to yourself as well. Defile it the whole body and set it on fire the course of nature. And look at this, it is set on fire of hell. Right? So it's doing a lot of damage to other people, to the fact that it doesn't even say it's like a normal fire. You know, words is like not like a normal fire, it's like, a, it's like the fires of hell that almost like can't be, it's, it's almost impossible to extinguish. You know, so you think about, um, you know, like a, like a real fire, like, you know, we had those bushfires. Eventually it goes out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then, the, you know, the rain came. You know, after two weeks of really bad fires, and everyone's happy when the rain came and put the fire out. But, you know, this is set on fire of hell. It makes you think the fires of hell are, do not get extinguished. And that's what our words are like. You know, sometimes when words go out, it's like they don't get extinguished. They, they stay with people. And this is why we have to be, we have to be careful. It's a world of iniquity. It reminds me of Proverbs 10, verse 19. In the multitude of words, look at this, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. <laughs> this is what, this is like, I always have to, it's good to remind yourself of these verses, right? The Bible says, you know, the more you talk, the more you're likely to sin, because in a multitude of words, there, there, doesn't, there wanteth not. It means it doesn't, there's no lack of sin in a multitude of words. 
the more you talk, the more likely you're going to sin. And that's why he's saying it's wise. If you can refrain from talking, you're going to sin less. <laughs> Proverbs 10, verse 19. All right, so um, where am I here? My notes. Let's go on. James 3, verse 7. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. See, because you can tame an animal because it can only be in one place. You know, but words can spread uncontrollably. And you think about, like, think about the sort of things that people have tamed in this world. You know, now with the internet, it's like I was, you know, I was, I was watching this guy play the ukulele on YouTube last night. And it's just like, oh, like, like, you just think, like, man, these people are just so talented. But, you know, you think there's not that actually many people that are extremely talented in the world, but probably we just know them all now because of the internet. You know, the internet's kind of brought them all together. It's the same, I'd say, with animals. You know, people have tamed all sorts of animals, and maybe now with the internet you can see the sort of animals that people have tamed. I mean, think about it. People have tamed bears. People have tamed lions. People have tamed monkeys, birds. People have tamed lizards. I mean, people have tamed, I mean, think about like, you know, even when, when you go to the zoo, I mean, they've tamed seals, people have tamed dolphins, and then even like those, uh, what about those killer whales, you know, those black whales, and the, they even tame the whale to push them along the, see, that's pretty crazy, the things that they do, and I remember watching a documentary that sometimes the animals turn on them, you know, pull them underneath the sea. But I mean, people have even tamed, like, tamed fleas, you know, the flea circus? where people can tame fleas to jump, do different things, and, and, and budgery guys. And, I mean, think about the things that they tame in this world, whether, whether it's small, like insects. They tame birds, you know, birds that would normally be free to fly, yet they tame them. I think about Taronga Zoo, there's the bird show. They tame things in the water. But the Bible's saying, you know, the tongue is even more difficult to tame than those. All right, so we need to beware of the dangers of our words. So... When we think about words spreading and being careful with our words, obviously, you know, the, the most practical application is gossip. Right? We need to be careful when we are revealing secrets, you know, talking about other people, talking negatively about other people. Usually, usually when we talk about gossip, we're talking about, talking, about somebody, um, talking about someone behind their back with bad intentions. Obviously, if you talk behind somebody's back with good intentions, that's probably a good thing. You know, you're praising somebody, things like that. People don't tend to worry about that. If, if you, you find out somebody's talking about you, they're saying all this nice stuff, you're, gonna be, you're not going to say, like, stop gossiping about me. You, know, you probably want more of that. You know, people say good things about you. So when we say gossip, usually we're referring to talking about someone with bad intentions. So this is why you need to internalize this chapter and realize the damage that words can do because nowadays the world runs on gossip, doesn't it? I mean, that's like what you see on YouTube and that's what you see in the news and you see in the media. It's all about gossip. And even, you know, don't, don't fall into the trap of being a talebearer, being a gossip, because this is the sort of damage that you can do. Right? So we need to be very careful. Now, there can be good reason to talk about someone with good intentions, even though what you're talking about is negative. You know, for example, you know, somebody might be in a grievous sin. There might be conflict between people that needs to be resolved. So sometimes there is good reason to have to reveal something, right, that, that would otherwise be secret. But, so, um, so we're not saying that there's never a, an appropriate time to reveal something, because sometimes there is. But we have to take care. So some of the things we have to consider are is it necessary? You know, if you're going to reveal a secret, if you're going to say something negative about somebody in order to solve a problem with good intentions, right? Because it's obviously a matter of, if you have bad intentions, it's always wrong. Right? You can never do something right with bad intentions. But sometimes where the gray area is, is when you have good intentions. You know, you're trying to solve something. Maybe there's a problem that you need to try and fix, right? So sometimes you need to reveal something with good intentions. But here are some things to consider when you do that. Number one, is it necessary? You know, do you need to get involved, right? And risk revealing something that you don't need to reveal. So is it necessary? Are you the right person to reveal it? Maybe you heard something, but are you the right person to solve it? 
So you might be taking on a problem that isn't your problem to solve, and then when you go and tell somebody else about it, you are actually revealing a secret that you shouldn't be revealing. Right? Another thing you need to consider is, are you revealing it to the right person? Right? You say, oh, yeah, I need, some, I need some advice about this. I'm going to tell my mate, who's maybe like the biggest gossip in the world. So are you revealing it to the right person? You say, oh, yeah, but I was just getting his advice, my friend. Yeah, well, did you consider the damage that it's going to do now that you've revealed it to somebody else? You know, it might be somebody that you talk to a lot, but are you revealing it to the right person? And I'm sure there's some others, but these are some, just some things I was thinking about as I was preparing this sermon. So, no, it's not always wrong to reveal something. There are some circumstances where it's appropriate. But maybe some things to consider are, is it necessary? Are you the right person to reveal it? And are you revealing it to the right person? Right? So these are some things to take care of. And we must be extremely careful due to the nature of the tongue. And like we talked about, it's set on fire of hell. You know, once that gets out, you know, like the saying, like the cat's out of the bag. And once the cat's out of the bag, it's very hard to get back in. So it's a lot easier to prevent it than it is to control it once it's out there. All right? So we need to take care with our words. Take care with our words. Now, don't be a talebearer. Don't be a gossip. If you need to reveal a secret, you're going to need to ask yourself these questions. If you need to be very careful, you know, just like we, we, we use fire, you know, fire can, can do good things, like it cooks things for it, it keeps us warm, but it also causes a lot of damage. So we need to take care with our words. James 3, 9, Therefore, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of iron figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Now these next couple of verses, I mean, we're basically being exhorted to take heed to our words. He's talking about the, dan- you know, the influence of the words, the danger of the words. Now he's saying, look, you know, we should take heed to the things we say. I mean, we're meant to be children of God. We're meant to be saved believers. We're meant to be walking in the Spirit. So let's not be two-faced. Let's try and walk in the Spirit and not, you know, with the same mouth we bless God and then with the same mouth we, we curse men. You know, we don't want to be a hypocrite. We don't want to be two-faced. You want to bless God on Sunday, praise God on Sunday, and then on Monday curse man. You don't know, say all sorts of manner of evil things against man uh, and your neighbor on Monday. You, know, you want to be consistent. He's saying it shouldn't be like this. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. So this is how I feel about Christians that swear. You know, Christians that have filthy conversation. Christians that participate in dirty jokes and all that sort of stuff. You know, the same mouth that says, I love God, I am a Christian, is the same mouth that then speaks like the world. You know, so we shouldn't speak like this. swearing, dirty jokes, bullying. You know, the same mouth that says, I love God, I'm a Christian, uses words to, you know, negatively affect others. The same mouth that says, I love God, I love Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian, gossips about other people, you know, just wants to cause harm to other people. Not, not even considering, you know, the harm, you know, you're, you're more, you know, interested in the, in the juicy goss than the, the problems that it's going to cause. So we don't want to be like that as Christians. And this is what he's saying here. You know, if we're, if we're believers, if we love God, then let's make sure the mouth is like we see in the world. Like, does a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? So it's good. let's be one or the other. Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain yield salt water and fresh. Right, so fruit here is being used as an analogy for the words that we speak. Now, I want to just stop on this point here because, you know, this verse in Matthew 7, I'll read it and then I'll explain to you how it's normally understood. Uh, Matthew 7, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. See, now often verse 16 is used to say, oh, this is how you identify false believers, right? They'll say like, oh, you know, somebody says they're saved, but they don't have works. That's what they talk about, their fruits, right? And you're going to know them. So you'll know that somebody's not saved because they don't have the works, which is not true in my opinion, right? But this is the verse that's often used to support that. Now the context really is false prophets, right? Now, 
Normally in the world, false prophets, like the Pharisees, they were quite clean living, right? So you didn't necessarily know, you know, that by somebody's outward appearance that they were necessarily sinful on the inside. So this is why, you know, I believe what these fruits are referring to is the things that they say. And as you look at other verses in the Bible, it becomes abundantly clear that it is talking about the fruits. And this is why it's interesting that even in James 3, when it talks about the things you say, it uses the analogy of fruit as well. So fruit is about duplication, but it's also about duplicating the things you say, right? So it says here, Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Why, why is like speech like fruit? Because, see, you get the word, it's in you, and then when you say it, it's like duplicating the, the words that are in you. So what it's actually teaching here in Matthew 7, what I believe it's teaching is, is how do you identify a false prophet? Well, it's the things that they say. You know, that's why, like, you know, you might have a false prophet and they're performing all these miracles. Remember, like, in Matthew 7, they did wonderful works in Jesus' name. They cast out devils in Jesus' name. But how do you know that they're a false prophet? Beware, you know, that they're a wolf in sheep's clothing because of the fruit of their mouth, right? The things that they say, right? It's, and the things that they say is reflective of the things you believe. That's why when you, when you how do you know what you believe? It's because, you know, when, when you think about what you believe, what is it? It's words that are in your head, isn't it? It's not just, it's not just feeling. You get know, feeling, but you say, like, what do I believe? They're, they're words. And this is why when, you, when the word of God dwells in you and you believe it, you're believing the words of the Bible and the word of God is, is now in you. Luke 6, let me show you. For a good tree bringeth forth corrupt fruit, neither doth a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, bringeth forth, see the words, bringeth forth that which is evil. For look, for the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. See there? Matthew 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, look at this, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So it's interesting, right? You'll know them by the fruit. God's going to know you by your fruit because you will be judged by the words that you speak. Why? Because the words that you speak out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh, and this is why God can judge you by your words, because your words reflect what you believe. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. So fruit is used as an analogy for words. Why? Because it's bringing forth that which is out of the heart. And if you understand what the Bible teaches about words and the analogy of fruit, then you will understand Matthew 7, I believe, the correct way and not use it to misjudge people's salvation because you're not judging it by the works. You're judging it by the words. All right? Let's continue. Actions over words. As we go into James 3, verse 13, actions over your words. James 3, 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. So this, this is along the lines of thought, actions speak louder than words. Saying, hey, you're spiritual, you're a wise man, you have a lot of, a lot of knowledge, then show it by the things you do. Right? Let him show out of a good conversation. So remember, conversation this is not saying, you know, let him show, like do, do a long-form podcast and tell everyone how good you are. A good conversation, conversation in the King James Bible is your lifestyle. Right? So communication um, you know, filthy communication. That's more talking about the words that you speak. But conversation is your lifestyle. Now, obviously, that includes the things you say as well, but it's more than that. So it's saying, hey, if you're a wise man, you have a lot of knowledge, then show by the way you act. His works with, and there's the attitude, meekness of wisdom. 
right? So you're not proud about the things you say or the things you do. You know your place. You're humble. There's humility there, right? So actions speak louder than words. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. So you want your actions to speak louder words. You want, you know, you don't want to talk about how spiritual you are if your heart isn't right with God. Right? So if your heart's not right with God, you've got bitter and envying and strife in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. So don't say something that you're not. Right? So, so oh, this verse is saying, hey, if you have that in you, then make it show. But don't pretend if you don't. Right? So it's just about not being a hypocrite, not being two-faced. So actions over your words. Let's go to 1 John 3. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So if you think about it, it's, it's very interesting that we, we say we should have actions with our words, actions over our words. And, and I find it interesting that God's words literally became action. You think about it. Because like, like, his words were manifest in the flesh. So he's not just saying like he loves us. He's not just saying he's going to die for us and be our saviour. But those words literally became action. Uh, that's, that's, that's pretty profound if you think about it. So hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is, and this is why I see, this is why I don't like the understanding that of the Trinity that God is only ever, God the Father is only ever separate from God the Son, right? Because if that's the case, you know, they say, well, then God sent somebody else. Yeah, he showed his love by giving his Son. But see, I always thought it was a diminishment of God's love if God the Father sent, like, another person, but that other person was not also him, right? Because the love was that he laid down his life for us. God actually, it was him, the Son of God, Right? And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You know, I don't think it's a greater sacrifice to send somebody else to die for the world if that other person is not actually you. Because the greater sacrifice, you know, like Jesus says, greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Verse 17, But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, lo- let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You see, like actions over your words. You can't just, you know, like, well, like we saw in James, you know, chapter 2. You say, hey, somebody's hungry. You say, depart, be, be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things that are needful to the body. You know, what does the prophet? So God wants us to have actions over words. Our actions speak louder than words. First Peter 3. Now, this is often some advice that you give to um, wives that are, you know, struggling, you know, having contention in their marriage or maybe disagreements in their marriage. Look at this. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, look at this, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. So you see that word conversation is your lifestyle, the way you live. So it doesn't make sense if he says they may also, without the word, be won by the talking of the wives because it's without the word. So you see how conversation does not just does not mean talking in the Bible. It means your lifestyle. They also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. So how so how, how do you win over your husband without necessarily preaching or nagging your husband? While they behold your chaste conversation, here's that word again, coupled with fear. Who's adorning, what is that, the outwardness, let it not be that outward adorning of playing the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So you see how that's like, it's without the word, which is in the sight of God, a great price. So this idea that actions speak louder than words, now this principle doesn't only apply to women, right? This can apply to anyone, right? Where, you know, if you want to influence somebody, you want to change somebody's opinion, maybe you want to convince somebody of something, actions sometimes speak louder than words because it definitely does in marriage, right? Where, where the, the way the wives may conduct themselves and they behave and maybe the way the word of God 
is changing the woman inwardly will have more impact on the husband than just simply nagging him and preaching to him. Right? This is what the Bible is saying here. So this idea that actions speak louder than words. Proverbs 27, verse 1. Look at this. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Right? So this is a good principle to live by. That You don't boast yourself of how spiritual you are. Let your actions show. Right, so going back to that verse in James, well, how am I linking it? Remember this verse in verse 13? Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge? Are you just going to tell everyone how much you know, how wise you are? No, let him show out of a good conversation. His works with meekness of wisdom. So it's going to line up here with Proverbs 27. You boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth, so all the things you're going to do. See, let another man praise thee. See, so it's better when others praise you than when you praise yourself, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. All right, let's continue. So we have one more section. James 3, we're going to go from 15 to 18. So this is now heavenly wisdom versus earthly wisdom. All right, and the difference between them. James 3, 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Right? So, what is the sort of wisdom that descends not from above? Right? So, it's from below. It's earthly. So, when you think of earthly, what do you think of? Physical. Right? It's like temporary. It's carnal. It's how it makes you feel fleshly, materialistic. That's the sort of wisdom that, dis that, that is earthly, that, that, that comes from beneath, I'd say. Sensual. What's the sort of wisdom that is, that is earthly? It's sensual. So what is that? It's very based on feelings. It's emotionally driven. And, and sometimes when I think of feelings and emotional, it's very, it's very unclear. Right? The word, word of God is more clear, right? Because it's just based on what the Bible says, as opposed to the wisdom being sensual. It's about what you feel. When you think about, uh, you know, like the Pentecostals, that always talk about like, oh, you don't have this feeling. But religions or religious experiences that are based on feelings, sometimes they are very unclear. Sometimes they contradict, you know. What happens if they contradict? Well, whose feelings were right? Right? Whereas when you base things on the Word of God, the wisdom that descends from above, you know, you know that it's, it's, it's more clear. It removes more doubt. Uh, it's devilish. So what's the sort of wisdom that is devilish? Well, it's sinful. It's against God. It's anti-God. It's harmful. It hurts people. It's unloving. It's contentious. It causes fights. But what's the opposite? James 3. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. So the wisdom, it's from above. So this is talking about the heavenly wisdom. So when you think about from above, what do you think? It's spiritual wisdom. It, it's, it's wisdom that will be of eternal use. It's godly. But look, about, look at this. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. So what does that mean? It's truth before unity. See, we don't just have unity at, for the, at the sake of truth. We don't just put truth aside for the sake of peace. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful. So, so the truth is more important than just having peace amongst people. Right? So wisdom from above is not just peace at all costs. Right? We want peace through unity. So it's first pure, truth before unity. And you don't even have true unity anyway if you don't uh, have truth. Right? So you can have peace, but not necessarily true unity. It's first pure. What does it mean by pure? Well, it's appropriate. Chase. These are just some words I was thinking of when I was thinking of pure. Clean. You know, it's clean. Then peaceable. So peaceable you think of unity, but remember, unity is only peace in truth. Because you can have peace without truth, and you don't really have unity, do you? I don't think that's real, the real peace that God wants, and that's why peace comes after purity. Right? Unity. It's peaceable, it's meek, it's humble. Right? When you think about something that's peaceable, you're trying to get along with people, 
usually when you're trying to get along with people, you need to have some humility. You need to be willing to give. You need to be willing to submit sometimes to another's wishes so that you can keep the peace. Gentle. What do you think of gentle? It's soft. It's tender. You know, easy to receive. But something is gentle. You know, when somebody says something to you harshly, when something is gentle, it's a lot easier to receive, isn't it? Well, the wisdom that is from above is gentle. It's easier to receive. Easy to be entreated. So what do you think of when you think of easy to be entreated? Approachable. It's more accepting of others. Right? Full of mercy. When I think of mercy, I think of giving others the benefit of the doubt. You know, sometimes when somebody's wrong, rather than just thinking that they have mal intent, you have a bit of mercy and think, well, maybe they had good intentions. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Maybe they thought they were doing the right thing or they had, you know, they had a reason for why what they did. I just don't think of them as some evil person that's out to harm people. You know, you give them a bit of grace. You know, mercy means that you, you do things for people that may be undeserved. This is the wisdom that's from above, full of mercy and good fruits. Ah, so you remember we talked about before, good fruits, you know, that sort of things we say. But also think about, you know, the fruit of the Spirit being a good example. You know, bringing forth, you know, you know having good fruits means that it duplicates, right? It brings forth more good through our example, things that, the things that we do. Without partiality. Remember we talked about partiality in James chapter 2, and we're treating people differently from the outward appearance. That's what it means without partiality. Right? You don't become partial in yourselves. And become judges of evil thoughts, it said in James chapter 2. So without partiality, think of you know, being fair, being just. You know, judging by the inward man, not the outward. Not, not the outward appearance. And without hypocrisy. So hypocrisy is you know, the things that you say and you don't do. Right? Double standards, being two-faced. Right? That's the sort of wisdom that's from above, not the wisdom that is from the earth. In James chapter 3.18, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Right? And that, that's how James chapter 3 ends. And the only thought I want to give you on this verse is, see, peace doesn't come automatically. See, the fruit, of the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace, look at this, of them that make peace. See, so peace is not something that necessarily happens automatically. You know, there has to be peacemakers. Why? Because, you know, sometimes when there's contention, somebody has to give, somebody has to be the more wise person to, to make that peace. And, and this is why I think this verse it reminded me of Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the children of God. So peace isn't the absence of conflict, you know, true peace. You know, sometimes people think they have peace in their home um, and they think peace is just the absence of conflict. But you don't actually have unity in your home. And this is why communication is so important. And, and you know, you, you apply all these practical wisdom from above, you can have more open communication in your home. So that, you know, you don't want just the sort of peace where it's the absence of conflict. You actually want the sort of peace that God intends, whereas it's peace, unity in the truth, right? And then you have true peace. But the only way that that's going to happen is it doesn't happen automatically. See, it requires communication. It requires conversation. It requires trust. It requires this wisdom from above. And then you're able to make peace and experience the true peace that God intends. All right, so I hope you learned something in James chapter 3. There's a, there's a bit there, the earthly wisdom, the, the, the heavenly wisdom. And, you know, a big part of that earthly wisdom or that heavenly wisdom is how we speak. All right, so if, if there's one thing I want you to walk away with in this sermon is to remember the danger that our words can cause. I and mean, we need to be wise with our words and be very careful with revealing secrets and the damage. You know, think about the tongue is a fire, right? And it's much better to have actions over words, isn't it? And that's the sort of wisdom we want. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word this morning as we reflect on the dangers of the tongue. Lord, help us to, have a, have a, help us to bridle our tongues so that we can bridle the whole body. So we pray, Lord, that we really internalize the, the danger that our words can have and Lord, that we um, take heed to your word this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.